I'm going to focus primarily on some of the data that we've been able to, to add to this, to this uh, treatment and to this disease. Um, so anyway, let's, let's proceed ahead. Um, so I don't have any disclosures. Um, so as an outline, I uh, I'll once again talk about just a single slide, a surgeon's view of the histology, which is a very simplistic approach perhaps, but I uh, appreciate uh, Mark Valasek, Valasek's uh, introduction to this, this topic at the beginning. But I'll kind of give, give our perspective from a surgical side as well as talk about some of the risks of disseminated disease and then talk about the, the HIPEC technique in a little bit more detail. Um, Dr. Alexander gave a great introduction to that. And then I'll, I'll focus the most of the talk on the end on, on our results and, and some of the, the, the contributions that we've been able to, to make and, and look at our, our experience with this. Um, so. So once again, this is a very simplistic view of this, but as I see it as a surgeon, you know, the, the, probably the easiest demarcation in appendiceal tumors are between carcinoids and carcinomas. Obviously, we're not hearing anything about carcinoid tumors today. I'm not going to talk about that. It's not the focus of, of this forum, but, uh, but there's just several types, obviously. But in terms of carcinomas, maybe this is not a simplistic way, I don't know, but um, there's, there's mucinous tumors, non-mucinous, and then signet ring cell I classify as a different, different disease entity, although they are technically mucinous. Um, but, uh, but as a surgeon, you know, we often divide up these tumors into high grade and low grade, and that helps us with our discussions with patients. It helps us with being able to, to determine the, what we call the biology of the disease, how, what the prognosis will be. And that's very much an overly simplistic version of it. There's certainly a lot of gray areas between high-grade and low-grade disease, but that's often how we view it. Many mucinous tumors come in both types, as Dr. Balasek mentioned. Many of the non-mucinous carcinomas of the appendix are more like colon cancer, and they're more high-grade. And then the signet ring cells uh, type is a, a high-grade variant. So, so we know, uh, as we've heard, that these tumors, particularly the mucinous tumors, which most of my talk will be on, uh, are at very high risk of peritoneal dissemination. How high of risk, and that was discussed a little bit, there's a wide variability, and it's determined by the grade of the tumor, high grade, low grade, or intermediate grade, presence of extra appendiceal neoplastic cells, and other mostly unknown factors. If you look at studies of this, the risk of patients that have a mucinous tumor of the appendix, the risk of them be becoming a PMP patient, if you will, or having carcinomatosis is variable, four to 33% or even higher in some studies. Many, uh, there's some series that, that estimate it to be about 20% overall for mucinous lesions. Most of this comes from two, two large series, uh, or two small series actually, but two series nonetheless of, of these kinds of tumors. And um, these basically highlight the variability and the risk of peritoneal dissemination. So these are series of 65 and 116 patients. Some of this data was presented by, by Mark at the beginning. They included a number of these lamin lesions, low-grade low appendiceal mucinous neoplasms, and they characterized, they followed patients for a median of 48 months, which maybe is not even long enough in this disease because we know the, the low-grade varieties have a very indolent course and can progress over many, many years. But nevertheless, they followed them for four, 48 months in, this, in these studies, and they, they characterized the risk of peritoneal dissemination by uh, the, the presence of extra appendiceal mucin at the time of their diagnosis. So these are people that did not initially present with full-blown PMP. They had disease that seemed to be mostly confined to the appendix. If patients had, the one study had a few patients that had no periappendiceal mucin, and they found after 48 months, none of them developed peritoneal dissemination. And those that had just acellular mucin had very low risk of peritoneal dissemination, less than 10% after a median of 48 months. And then those that had a cellular component, as, as Mark dis discussed at the beginning, had a high risk. So this is where the, the low risk of peritoneal dissemination comes and the high, high risk designation. So people that have mucin that's cellular outside of the appendix but don't have peritoneal dissemination are at high risk, um, maybe up to 75% risk of having eventual peritoneal disease. So we take that into account when we see patients who are fortunate enough to be diagnosed in the early stages. Unfortunately, many patients uh, are not, and they, they present to us with, with widespread disseminated disease. So because, because the risk is relatively high, oh, I, little digression here, you know, there's certainly no one exactly knows. Uh, once again, Mark discussed this at the beginning, but how do these diseases disseminate to the perineum? How does it happen? Why is it so common in appendix, but maybe not so common with other GI cancers? And uh, the risk is, 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 this is all presumed, but you know, there's certainly rupture of the appendix. We know in appendicitis, the appendix ruptures, and 
spills its contents to the peritoneal cavity, which causes someone to be ill. Um, so this can happen with a large appendix that's full of mucin. It can rupture. Um, there's this mucin extrusion that perhaps occurs. Maybe it's, it's uh, pressure necrosis or, or, uh, uh, or it's a pushing invasion. And then there's certainly higher grade tumors that can directly invade through the wall of the appendix um, and then spread into the peritoneum. The appendix is obviously a small organ, so it doesn't have to go nearly as far, and the appendix is small and prone to rupture. So these things perhaps are, are what explain some of the high risk of peritoneal dissemination. So once it's disseminated, for most metastatic cancers, we tend to treat with systemic treatments. Um, and systemic chemotherapy for appendiceal mucinous carcinoma has been uh, tried. Um, Dr. Fanta will go into this in much more detail, but in general, for the low-grade tumors in particular, there's a relatively limited role. And most of the regimens that we use systemically have been extrapolated from the colorectal uh, experience. And so you'll see that in some of the studies. There's a few series here that, that I uh, will, will show you, but that, that include mucinous tumors of the appendix, uh, people that had uh, peritoneal dissemination, and what the results were. So if you look here, these are three different series that gave various regimens. Fulfox is a common regimen used for colon cancer. Uh, and then fi it includes 5-FU, and so these other two series mostly included 5-FU-based therapies. Um, you know, these are fairly small series of patients, 20, 54, 78, and they included a mix of low-grade and high-grade histologies. What's interesting is that if you look at the patients that have all low-grade disease, there's actually a very low response rates to chemotherapy in that setting. And that's what we see clinically. Patients that have true low-grade lamin-type tumors with low-grade mucinous carcinoma uh, peritonei don't respond very well to systemic treatment. However, those that have high-grade disease that behave more like an adenocarcinoma, more like colon cancer, have a much higher response rate, 44%. Um, and then there's the series had a mix, and it's somewhere in between the two. So certainly, I think the take-home message is low-grade lesions don't respond very well at all to systemic treatments, whereas higher-grade lesions tend to. So the poor results with systemic chemotherapy and the fact that this is metastatic disease, but it is confined to a region of the, of the body, has led to uh, an aggressive you know, surgical and chemotherapeutic approach that, that Dr. Alexander helped pioneer. So um, the strategy is, is, is relatively straightforward. And um, basically, we approach patients after they've potentially finished chemotherapy. Some of our patients are on chemo, and we recommend that for various reasons, or some are not. Um, about a month after chemotherapy has ended, eight weeks after uh, patients are on Avastin or Bevacizumab, um, the, the surgical approach is basically to, first of all, explore the entire abdomen and see the extent of disease. Um, as Dr. Alexander pointed out, the, the imaging cannot be entirely helpful. Um, it sometimes is helpful. We certainly use it, but it does not always predict the extent of disease. So the first step in the procedure is just to look around and see how much disease there is and if we think we can actually remove it. That usually requires lysis of adhesions. Many patients have had prior surgeries, um, and the disease itself certainly causes adhesion formation. So that it requires us to, to tediously lyse all, the, all of these adhesions. This can be a major component of the procedure, depending on how, how extensive they are. But it's important to do that to, to really examine all quadrants of the abdomen, and also to potentially expose all quadrants to the, to the chemotherapy later on in the procedure. And then the goal is of the cider reduction portion is to remove all visible disease, essentially. And literally all of the visible disease is the goal, um, down to what we call a CC0 cider reduction, meaning there's no gross residual nodules, or at least down to, to less than 2.5 millimeter size nodules or less. Um, and this is, includes resecting the individual tumor nodules. It may involve stripping a sheet of peritoneum. The peritoneum is the lining of the abdomen, and many times it's amenable. There's many, many tumors in a region that we can just remove as a big sheet of peritoneum. Um, and sometimes it involves formal visceral resection if, if the organs themselves are directly invaded. Um, you know, the limiting factors, in many cases, we're not able to do a, what we call a complete cytoreduction. That means we can remove all the visible disease, or most of it. And the, the limiting factors are often uh, the, the amount of bowel that would have to be involved. So how much bowel involvement uh, can limit our ability to remove all the disease. Um, the, the amount of disease sometimes around the, the, the porta hepatis, which is the, 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 the region of uh, tissue around the liver where the, the blood flow to the liver goes to. That's a very difficult area sometimes to clear. And sometimes the, the pelvis is so heavily involved with disease 
uh, that all these structures are involved, it's difficult to remove. So those are the limiting factors, the main limiting factors that impede our ability to be able to do a complete cider reduction. So this just shows, this is from one of Dr. Sugarbaker's uh, texts about um, doing a peritonectomy. And, and the principle, this is just a cartoon of this, but this is the diaphragm here. And you can see these clamps on this peritoneum. The peritoneum is a very, normally a very thin membrane that, um, that, is, that has certainly a role in the abdomen. Um, as a barrier and as a um, uh, mostly a barrier function, but it certainly can, can harbor these tumors, and that's where these tumors tend to go, but we can remove them all as a big sheet as opposed to individually taking off each, each tumor nodule. And so we, do, we basically remove this big sheet of diseased peritoneum as a, as a single uh, specimen as opposed to a bunch of individual specimens. Um, so this just shows some pictures from the diaphragm from one of Dr. Lowy's cases. You know, you can see some of this yellow, whitish tissue in here is the tumor that's on the peritoneum, and then this all is stripped off as a single sheet, and you can see what's left behind is, a, is the muscle of the diaphragm, but the diaphragm itself is intact, but the lining of it has been removed. And that's sort of the goal, is to remove that, all the, that disease as a big sheet of tissue. Um, the omentum, as Dr. Alexander showed n numerous photos, similar photo here, the omentum is often heavily involved with disease. It's a, it's a common repository of these tumors. So it's the one structure that we al almost always universally remove, uh, even if it's not this grossly diseased, just because it's a common place for these tumors to go to. Not a lot of significant consequences of having the omentum removed. It certainly has some role, but uh, can be removed safely. And um, the small bowel, as, as Dr. Alexander mentioned, is, is the limiting factor many times. And you can see here, this just shows some, some disease on the mesentery. The mesentery is the leaflet of tissue around the bowel that supplies blood and takes away nutrients from the intestine. Difficult to manage all these little tumors here. You, you can individually take them off, but then we often get into the blood vessels that supply the bowel, so we have to do a bowel resection. If this is very extensive, it can, we, we're not able to remove all those tumors. You can see this lesion here is infiltrative on the bowel. Certainly to remove this would require a resection of that segment of intestine. And we can do that, but if there's 10 of these sections or 20 of these areas, it becomes very difficult and high risk. Here it just shows sometimes we can burn individual small tumors on the mesentery with a cautery pen uh, where we can burn these tumors, but sometimes we can remove them. And then sometimes if there's individual tumors on the bowel, we can actually excise them and maybe repair a little, a little hole in the intestine as opposed to doing a formal resection. But the, the small bowel is often the, the li a limiting factor in how much disease we can actually remove. Um, and then the pelvis just, just shows a patient that had probably very extensive pelvic disease, but many times we can just remove the lining of the pelvis, the peritoneum, just like we do in the diaphragm and save all the surrounding structures. But occasionally the, the colon or the uterus or the ovaries in particular are diseased and we have to remove them um, as well as part of the, as part of the cytoreduction. So this just shows some of those pictures here. And obviously the reconstructive phase is, is more intense for these kinds of uh, procedures. So then once the cytoreduction is done and then we're able to, to do a complete cytoreduction, then we, 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 um, we do the HIPEC procedure, so hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemo. As, as we mentioned already, mitomycin C is what we use. It's, it's an old chemotherapy agent that is, um, that is it, it is an indictment on, on I think, it's, uh, clinicians that we still use this same drug. We have the most data with this, and that's probably why largely it's still used, but there's a lot of room for improvement, I think, with this. But that's what we use. We generally heat the abdomen up to a pretty high temperature um, to, to, to augment the effects of the chemotherapy. We typically use the closed technique here. Most centers in the US use a closed technique. In Europe, they, they often leave the abdomen open during this procedure, but we temporarily close the skin around the catheters. These are temperature probes that help us to monitor the temperature of the abdomen during the procedure. And then, as, as we saw, it basically circulates through, through a perfusion pump, and as well as that includes a heating element to keep the solution warm, so that's how we warm the abdomen. And uh, we obviously maintain their urine output um, to a relatively high degree during the procedure because there is some absorption of the chemotherapy. We want to make sure that is washed out of the system uh, during the, the technique. And we monitor the, the patient's systemic temperature closely because the patient's systemic whole body temperature can also become elevated during this procedure. So we do this for 90 minutes. Um, we uh, do with constant agitation of the abdomen during the, during the technique. And then we wash out the chemotherapy after uh, an additional, with additional two liters of, of fluid at the end of the procedure so that the chemotherapy is washed out by the time the 90 minutes is over with. Um, 
So, and then at the end of that, then we reopen the abdomen and then do any reconstruction that needs to be done. So if there's a bowel resection that we did, then we may have to do the, the, the reconnection or the anastomosis at that point. Many times we will leave a chest tube if there's diaphragmatic disease that we had to deal with. And then many times uh, we leave a G tube because uh, one of the complications or, or side effects of this is patients have a prolonged ileus or, or, or bowel paralysis after surgery. And so this allows us to drain the stomach temporarily um, after the procedure. So I think, you know, before showing some of our data, I think it's the, the most important thing is to, to point out that this is certainly done all over the world now, as, as, uh, as we saw, and it's being done increasingly. Um, these are some of the largest series. There, there's new ones that come out all the time. Probably the largest uh, series that's been published is this international group that included about 2,000 patients that had appendiceal mucinous tumors that underwent HIPEC, or most, the vast majority of the patients underwent HIPEC. And if you look at the, the survival rates, these are mostly low-grade patients. I include the percentage of low-grade histology in these various series. And you can see, and this is based on the percentage of patients that had what we would call a complete cytoreduction, meaning all disease removed or down to 2.5 millimeters or less as we measure it. Um, and then the, the survival rates, uh, and then, then both of the median survival and the five-year survival. So for example, this study, the largest included two-thirds or so of low-grade patients. Most of them had a complete side of reduction, and the median survival rate is actually very long. Um, the Wake Forest group has been doing this for a very long time. They have, they have a lot of experience with this, certainly similar survival rates. This is the Pittsburgh group, perhaps a little less, although you know, the low-grade histology maybe was a little lower than some of the other, other studies, um, and et cetera. You can see from UK and Dr. Sugarbaker's experience with this. So we certainly have seen, at least on these series, that, that patients can, can do very well for a very long time. What you don't see are any randomized studies on this slide because there aren't any. And there's, this is a whole separate topic, but it's a difficult uh, disease entity to study, difficult disease entity to do a study in where we could randomize patients and compare them from one treatment to the other. But the experience has certainly, has, has certainly broadened over time. So, at UCSD, uh, since Dr. Lowy came and started the program, we've done about uh, over 300, certainly, uh, as of this summer. But, but, uh, but around the 300 mark is a, is, a good, uh, bench, is a good estimate for how many we've done. Um, the vast majority of the patients that we do here are for appendix cancers, uh, which, is, which is true of many HIPEC centers around the country. Uh, we're, we're, we're more selective in patients that have carcinomatosis from colon cancer, for example. Uh, but mesothelioma, peritoneal mesothelioma is another disease entity we're not going to talk about today. And then we have a few ovary, ovarian and small bowel primary cancer patients that we've done. But two-thirds of our experience is in appendix cancer. So the bulk of our HIPEC experience is done in patients that, that have had appendix tumors. Um, you know, our median operating time is, is, is about seven hours. Obviously, there's a wide range here, up to 14 hours, depending on the extent of disease and what all has to be done. Um, our median estimated blood loss is similar to other, other series, um, you know, several, a few hundred cc's, but it's also widely variable. Some have hardly any, and some patients have require lots of blood transfusions during the procedure, depending on the, the blood loss. Um, our PC, the PCI index, once again, is 0 to 39. It's just a, a, a relatively crude, but a measure of how much disease patients have. Um, our, ours and our experience has been about 14, so the, the range, the full range is 0 to 39, but our range has been 0 to 32, so the higher the number, the more extent of disease patients have. Um, and then uh, the CC scores are broken down here. This is, once again, how much disease is left at the end of the procedure. Obviously, the goal is to have none or very small amounts. CC2 is it just uh, means there's more disease left than, than 2.5 millimeters. And then in terms of what, what we have to do to do a complete cytoreduction, reduction, our, uh, we have about an average an anastomosis is a bowel connection. We have a, the average is one. Um, although it ranges from none to up to six. And then uh, on average, we end up having to do about two organ resections. And that, I'll show you on the next slide what that includes. But, that in, but that's also a wide range of this, from zero to up to 10. And, um, and our median length of stay is about 10 days. Um, but obviously, there's a wide range there as well. So, so what types of organ resections, or even non-organ resections, but other procedures have we done in our experience here? And, you can see the most common ones. I should order these in terms of their, their, their incidence. But you can see the most common things are things like a partial colectomy, which could include removing the right colon or the sigmoid colon, which can be diseased. 
Um, cold cystectomy and removal of the gallbladder is relatively common in these procedures. About 28% of the time do we have to do that. Uh, splenectomy also relatively common. The spleen is heavily diseased in many cases. It's difficult to organ to strip the surface of because it can bleed. And so we, we often, if the spleen is involved, we tend to do a splenectomy. Um, and, you know, very commonly the, the liver surface is diseased, but not, it's not a true uh, lesion within the liver itself. So we're able to just remove the, the lesion on the surface of the liver, but not have to do a formal liver resection. Our rate of doing a formal liver resection is pretty low, about 4%. So only about 12 patients have we done a, what we call a formal liver resection or anatomic resection. And then once again, appendectomies, you might wonder why this is so low. It's because many patients have already had their appendix out by the time we're doing the surgery. So. So that's why it's, it's quite low. But obviously, if it's there, and that's the primary, it's always removed. Um, small bowel resections, et cetera. Ostomy formation is pretty low. We tend to reserve ostomies for people that have very low colon uh, connections or anastomoses that we worry about a leak. So we've, we've broken down our complications. So, so the one big project that we're, we're uh, nearly completed with is looking at our complication rates. And obviously, this is a very extensive procedure that requires a lot of, of training and expertise to do it. Uh, a, a big critique of the procedure overall is, is the complications associated with it, which are indeed uh, uh, formidable. And so this is looking at our complication rates um, by grade. And so if you're, for those many of you who are probably not familiar with the Clavian grade system, basically the, 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 what we call a major complications are these grade three, fours, and fives. On this scale, the grade three is a complication that requires some kind of intervention, a procedure, an operation to, inter to, to, to treat, like a drain or a trip back to the operating room. <coughs> grade uh, five is actually death from, from the procedure. Grade four is a life-threatening, like an ICU uh, complication. And then the other grades are listed here. So you know, about 40% of patients in our series have, have did not have a complication. Of those that had a major complication, so a grade three, four, and five, it's broken up here by disease type mo or by system. Mostly are infectious. Most of those end up are abscesses uh, that require a drain. I think that probably this is probably a more um, illustrative picture here, looking at um, various uh, you know complications that, that we've seen that are some of these are unique to, to the high pec procedure. Um, certainly, mortality rates are are, are low. They certainly, um, as more experience is is done with this procedure, I think we're more selective. Um, that, that mortality rate has dropped over time. That's true internationally as well. And I sort of picked some major series here to include sort of a comparison of, to the rest of the world. And it's pretty, pretty similar. So any complication, that includes any one through five complication, is very high, actually, about 60%. But the vast majority of those are the lower grade types. And so a major complication, grade three, four, or five, is about 16%. Trip, return trips to the operating room for a complication, about 3%. Anastomotic leaks or bowel leaks or, or fistula, relatively low. Uh, we've been fortunate to have that rate be fairly low. Um, abscess rates, you see there, wound infection rates. Ileus, delayed gastric emptying, that means the return of bowel function um, is, is, is relatively high, perhaps even higher than what's been published. Maybe it has to do with how we define this in our data set. But, and then um, uh, uh, clots, blood clots that happen are, 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 are about what was seen around the country. And then readmission rate, about 17%. We, measure, we define that as 60 days, um, although many studies only define it as 30 days. So, so whoops. So we, um, one of the things we did from this project is looked at variables that might predict a patient's risk of having a complication, or more specifically, a major complication, because that's important when we decide about who to operate on and about preoperative discussions that we have with patients, what's their risk of having a major complication. And we did all kinds of uh, analyses of this, but basically we did multivariate analysis to look at, and we've identified a few risk factors that put patients at risk for having a complication. One is the so-called Charlson comorbidity index. It's just a marker of other diseases or other conditions that a patient has called comorbidities that might put them at risk. If they have, if they have any other comorbidities, it certainly puts them at risk for having a complication after this procedure. Patients who have symptoms have higher risk of having a uh, complication uh, from their disease versus having no symptoms related to their disease. And then the prior resection status is also um, a risk factor. And then from, um, these are all preoperative variables, but we looked at operative variables as well. And patients that have the number of organs that have to be removed certainly increases the risk of having a complication afterwards. Um, so. Here you can see we ended up, we were able to make a uh, table, uh, a predictive model uh, 
based on some of these preoperative variables. We felt that the preoperative variables were probably the most useful because those are, we know those at the time that we meet patients in the office and can discuss their surgery. And so we're able to make this scale and, and look at, uh, assign different numbers to various uh, risk factors. And then we've, we're able to, to look at this and we can predict what a patient would get. And then we have the benefit from our database to go back and see how they actually did. And this model performs pretty well. We're, we're, um, you know, this is obviously only our own data, so the next step would be to compare this and use larger data sets from other institutions and see um, how, how, it, how it plays out and how predictive this model is, but it's been helpful for that. Um, just a few final slides here. Dr. Kelly has done some of this work, but looking at our readmission rates and predictors of readmission. So we looked at this in terms of who's at risk to, to, to recur or who's at risk to come back to the hospital. Once again, this comorbidity index, patients that had other health problems were at higher risk to, to return to be readmitted after the procedure. And then having any transfusion of blood, either during the procedure or after the procedure, increased the risk of having uh, a readmission. And then things like stoma, length of stay, were not predictive on independent uh, variable analysis. So. So we've, we've also looked at some of our high-grade patients. So these include patients that have very aggressive variants of both appendix cancer and of colorectal cancer. Many of these were signet ring cell patients or patients that have a more aggressive histology. And the time to recurrence is actually quite short. And even after HIPAC, it's only about 12 months in our high-grade appendix experience and about nine months in colorectal. And then if you look at this by the type of cytoreduction they had, how much disease was removed, there definitely is a big difference between patients who have no disease left at the end of the surgery and even those who have very small few millimeter deposits of disease. Now this is in high grade patients, so that doesn't include the low grade patients. And certainly lymph node status um, is an important predictor. And then we looked at um, sort of another multivariate analysis of this. And basically the most important variable of of, of if a patient's likely to recur who has high-grade disease is their lymph node status. Um, and then, so this was the instigation for a clinical trial that, that we just opened uh, um, for patients who have high-grade appendix cancers, uh, who have had a cytoreduction in HIPEC to get a, for a post-operative uh, chemotherapy regimen. We've had some anecdotal success with giving um, a more simplistic version of chemotherapy, just 5-FU and Avastin, or an oral version of 5-FU. And because the time to recurrence was about 12 months, we, we, we opted to design a study where we would give them sort of a maintenance type chemotherapy regimen of 12 months. And so these are people that have high grade appendix cancers who've had a complete site of reduction in HIPEC. Uh, we have the trial open here to give 12 months of this therapy and we're following them by imaging as well as by tumor markers for recurrence and seeing if we can impact uh, this, the, the outcomes after, after HIPEC. Once again, this is high grade patients. So we have a lot of other ongoing studies here. I don't, I'm not going to talk about any of these in any detail, but these are, these are kind of some ongoing things we're looking at. We're looking at now, sort of we, we looked at our high-grade uh, outcomes. Now we're looking carefully at our low-grade outcomes, and we're looking at that by various um, subtypes. One is by histology, so low-grade mucinous carcinomatosis, high-grade. And then we have a number of patients that we do HIPEC in who we don't find any cells anywhere. And our pathologists don't see that. And we certainly think that those patients have the best prognosis of all, but we'd like to actually investigate that a little further. Um, you know, the other, uh, the other entity we're looking at is patients who have high-grade bowel implants. Um, so those are certainly a high-risk group and a difficult group to manage surgically and, and medically. Um, KI-67 is a proliferative index. We're looking at Dr. Valasek's helping us do that on, on some of our specimens to see if that is a predictor of recurrence. And then uh, one other project that we've just started to investigate on our own experience, but we are definitely have planning to open this up to other, other sites, is looking at patients that we see who have a lamin, who have a low-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasm, but don't have peritoneal dissemination, and looking at that in a larger data set than some of the other studies that have been done, and just trying to figure out what is a patient's risk of having peritoneal disease who present in that manner. And then certainly looking at immune targets, and then we're doing a project now where we're looking at some cell-free DNA, so looking at testing to look at small fragments of DNA that are circulating in a patient's bloodstream to see if that could be used for surveillance or for diagnostic, diagnostic purposes. So anyway, happy to talk more. This is, this is our HIPEC team here. Um, you've seen or heard from, from many of us, or everyone's here today, so you can meet us all. But uh, this is our program, and happy to take any questions if there's time. <laughs>